actually want to thank Arts Queensland for inviting me uh, all this way to come and talk to you today and to talk to you about the UK's um, approach to cultural tourism and some of the work that I and colleagues have been doing over the, the last few years. Um, it, it's my first visit to Queensland, but not my first visit to Australia. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting under the skin uh, of some of the places whilst I'm here. So, um, as Kerry mentioned, I uh, wear a number of hats. Uh, I am a Director of uh, Marketing and Audience Development Agency Palmer Square that specialises in the arts, heritage uh, and cultural tourism uh, sectors, has done for well more years than I care to admit to. Um, and I'm also a Director of uh, Creative Tourist, of Creative Tourist um, Consults, which specialises in cultural tourism. So, well, why, why do we want to talk about cultural tourism uh, and what do we really mean by cultural tourism? Uh, depending on who you ask, you'll probably get a different definition. Um, and I know when I did my first degree, which is in, was in tourism studies, I think we spent the first term talking about what is tourism. And I think if you, if you talk to each other about what do we mean by culture, you'll get a lot of different ideas. And actually, when you put the two together, then that can be even more complicated. And if you talk to um, academics, um, they'll probably tell you that cultural tourism is about engaging with local people, culture and customs. And of course that's part of it and that's really important. But in the world that we're in now in particular, it is about economic growth. It is about encouraging more visitors to your destination to spend more money. It's also about changing perceptions of your destination as well. Um, now that might seem um, obvious or it might seem a little bit dirty in talking about um, money, um, but the only way that you'll get support at a local, regional, national level is if those policy makers understand that there is a potential to help to drive economic growth. However, it does take time to do that. What cultural tourism isn't, is a newfangled way of talking about joint marketing initiatives. Um, it isn't a fad. There is a danger that policymakers move on to the next thing and think we've done that, tick, let's try something else. It is about the long term. So, why particularly do we want to talk about cultural tourism? Why do we want to bother going on this journey which can often be quite a long journey and a tortuous uh, experience. Um, well, one of the things that really does help to differentiate your destination, your place from somewhere else, is culture. And I know I'm preaching to the converted there, you would all probably say the same thing. Um, but what cultural tourists are looking for is, is experiences. They don't want copycat places. They don't particularly want to go and do the things that they might do whilst they're at home when it comes to, say, retail and going to um, branded shops, if they could do that at home. They want to feel like they've got under the skin of a place, that they've got to know it, that they've maybe had a bit of an insider's view and feel like they have got to experience a place that they can then share with friends and colleagues and online um, as well. But the key thing about um, cultural tourism, and I will keep saying this throughout my talk this morning, and I was really glad to, to hear Kirsten talk about it before, is, is about the need to work in partnership. Um, this is something that you can't really do on your own. And you'll get very frustrated very quickly if you try to. But the great thing about the cultural offer is it's year round. And yes, you might have extremes of temperature, um, and certain times of the year where there's more happening, but cultural tourists are looking for experiences at different times in the year. They're looking to do things at weekends, they're looking to do things maybe when they've got friends and relatives visiting, they're looking to do things that um, mean that they are flexible about when and where they might travel to. Um, but as I mentioned before, one of the things that cultural tourism can really, really make a difference in is changing perceptions of the place. You know, I come from Manchester in, in northwest England, uh, and I recognise that you probably fit England into Queensland, um, but Manchester is probably known most internationally for maybe three things. One is football, 
One is being the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and the other is potentially music from about 1979, for about 10 years, from the Joy Division to the Happy Mondays via the Smiths. Um, and we're not really known domestically or internationally as being a cultural destination, but hopefully the work that we're doing is changing that um, perception. But in doing any work in cultural tourism, it's so important to be honest about your offer. There is no point, and we've all seen it, we've all experienced it, we might even have been part of it, seeing the kind of marketing hyperbole that talks up destinations, that when the visitor goes, it doesn't live up to it. And there is nothing worse than over-promising and under-delivering. The great thing about if you do get visitors to, to come to your place, and I know this from working in, in, in Manchester and across the UK, in some quite challenging areas, is that often their perceptions are quite low, um, their, their understanding of what you have to offer, offer, and then they come and have a fantastic time and they are more likely to then go away and tell more people. Um, so there's a really important aspect about understanding what your offer is. And that's not just your cultural offer. That's your tourism and hospitality offer. That's how easy is it to get to your place. What is your independent retail like? What is your independent food and drink offer like? How can culture add value to what is already being done by the tourism sector? Um, but when we talk about cultural tourists, in the same way as talking about local arts audiences, it's not a homogenous group. It's a diff you have to understand the differences within the different types of cultural tourists, whether they're first-time visitors, whether they're repeat visitors, whether they're coming as a couple, as a group, as a family. They all have different needs, whether they're more traditional in their tastes, whether they're looking for something a bit more contemporary. And it's really important to understand the kinds of visitors that you're looking for. So when looking at potential new markets, um, you know, do you have things like direct airline routes? Those things are important when people have got a vast choice of where they may want to go. They're going to look for, potentially, a, an easier option. Okay, so, I said I'd say it again, and I'm going to say it again. Um, if you take nothing else away from this morning, partnership working is the thing that I would get, hope to get across. This is about working with partners that you might already work with, but it's also about getting outside your comfort zone, working with other cultural partners, working with the tourism sector, so that's the public sector tourism agencies, that's the private sector tourism enterprises, so whether they're transport operators, accommodation providers, food and drink providers, retail operators. You have to think about the whole of the destination. It's a holistic approach. There's no point thinking that just because you know you have a good cultural offer that people will necessarily come if the rest of the offer is poor or the perception of the rest of the offer is poor. And of course, by working together, you have a stronger collective cloud to be able to get to the table and open doors with some of the partners that you might need to, to work with. If you go as an individual cultural organisation to a tourism agency or a transport operator and try and work with them, you'll find it's quite difficult. You might get one-off activity happening, but you're not likely to be able to generate an ongoing relationship. But there are lots of different ways to get involved, and the important thing um, this is quite often difficult for people to understand this. Cultural tourism is not diplomatic and it's not democratic. It isn't about, well, I'm here and I want to be part of it. It has to be market focused. You have to think about what the visitor wants and needs. It isn't product focused. It isn't partner focused. It isn't saying, well, we're at the table and we want to be involved. Therefore, we have to be included in everything that you do. You'll all get your chance at some point. Um, and that's quite hard for people to potentially leave their egos at the door or when they've got pressure from senior members of staff saying why are you spending time doing this, we're not seeing any results. This is about the bigger picture, this is about thinking of, uh, around the destination and not just yourselves. And when I talk about it being holistic and it's not just about marketing, 
It's actually about all aspects of your destination offer. It's also about programming. So do you actually program activity out of traditional seasons? Is there enough for people to do? Um, how do you talk about your offer on online? How do you engage with potential visitors? And it's also about thinking about where you want to be in five, ten years' time, and therefore what the journey is to get there. This is not a quick fix. This is not something that, that you do the odd campaign and you'll suddenly see thousands of visitors coming. Um, that's not how it works. So, um, this is a, a model that we've developed with Creative Tourist, um, which we work through with destinations. So in the top right corner, um, the working environment. So who are the people um, involved in this, who should be involved in this, who are the champions? You need somebody to take leadership in this. It, you, it might be you, it might not be you, and that's absolutely fine. It might not be you in your organisation, it might be somebody else. Um, who do you need to get round the table? What infrastructure resources can you already tap into? A lot of people always ask me, well, how much money have you spent on this? It's actually not about the money. It's about the commitment and it's about particularly sharing resources. And the key thing is that actually by sharing resources, you can make things happen. Yes, of course, extra money will, will help. Um, but you have to start and identify where you're prepared to invest yourself, whether that's people or money or activity that you're already doing. Um, but it's also about having a clarity of vision about where you want to go. And then moving on to the working partnerships. So many of you, I'll probably say all of you in some way, will be working in partnership with different organisations. So maybe there's a partnership that actually could be repurposed for cultural tourism, or a partnership that you could bring cultural tourism onto the agenda. You don't necessarily have to set up something new from scratch. It might be a great opportunity to bring some additional partners to the table as well. But who are the key agencies that need to be involved? It's really odd if you're working in this field to not be talking to the tourism, your main tourism agency. Um, and it, it, you, it looks like you're not serious if, you, if you're not going to talk to them. They have expertise that you don't have, and you have expertise that they don't have. They also understand visitors, and they know what the kinds of visitors that are coming to your destination, potentially better than you do. Um, but in working together, it's really significant that you look at the key messages for your destination. What are the key messages? You know, if we, if we talk about, if you think about your own place, what are the unique aspects to your proposition? How do people talk about your area? How would you explain your area to a visitor? And are you consistent in how you do that? Do you even think about that when you're promoting your own cultural um, activity, thinking about the messages that might be appropriate for visitors, not just for locals? And then looking at product development. Um, Again, this is not necessarily about having to spend a lot of money on creating lots of new events or, or even infrastructure. Um, this is about looking at your assets, doing an honest appraisal of your assets and understanding where the peaks and troughs are in the year, where you might have events that you can build activity around, what are the hooks that might get you some PR coverage that might help to generate interest What's the visitor welcome like in, in your area? Um, the wraparound offer is the, the food and drink and the retail and the accommodation. Where are the places that you recommend to your friends when they're coming to visit you? Because chances are, they're probably the kinds of places that visitors would want to go to and that you'd be happy to send a visitor to. And then looking at the marketing development, these things are all interconnected as I'm, I'm sure you can, you can tell is that understanding the segments that you're looking to target. Prioritising those segments, you won't have the resource to necessarily target all of the segments that you want to target. So who, where are the priorities? Are you looking at domestic? Are you looking at international? 
Are you looking at conversion of existing visitors to culture? We know, for example, in Manchester that a lot of the visitors that have historically come to the city don't actually engage with culture while they're there. It's a very successful business conference um, destination. We also have the largest student population in Europe. Um, but they don't necessarily engage with culture. So that's just as important, thinking about conversion of existing visitors as targeting new markets. And as you all know, targeting new markets is the most difficult thing to do and requires the most resource. What is the narrative for your place? What is that history and heritage? How do you articulate that? How do you talk about the current contemporary offer within the context of the history and heritage of your place? And what communication channels are you already using or have the act potential access to use to get your messages out there? The yellow line in the middle, this doesn't represent any one particular destination, this is just to show you how it works. We can plot a destination to see how strong they are in certain areas and how weak they are in certain areas and what they might need to do to move that yellow line into a better position. Okay. So, market segmentation. I'm sure if there's, there's a lot of marketers in, in the room, um, you'll know the uh, complexities around this. And there's just some examples. In the UK, we have that many different models. The Arts Council England has its own audience insight, market segmentation model for arts audiences. Maurice Argus McIntyre, a commercial research agency, actually have a, a base in New Zealand, have come up with their own culture segments model. The tourism agencies use something called Art Leisure. The National Trust has its own. So it just becomes really confusing. And, and we at Creative Tourist actually thought, this isn't desperately helpful. None of them are really looking at the crossover between culture and tourism. So we developed our own based on the research that we could access. And we have three, three main um, market segments. This is a very broad brush overview for you. I've got a lot more detail if anybody is particularly interested. But thinking about our Manchester post-industrial urban environment, um, there is a, a kind of more traditional market who are interested in the, the history and the heritage, um, probably more mainstream in their choice, they'd be interested in the museums and galleries offer, possibly the orchestras um, offer, maybe doing guided walks, that, that kind of thing. They'll want quality accommodation, eating out is important to them, probably looking for a weekend break somewhere not that far away that they can access quite easily. Then we have a more contemporary market, probably a bit younger, um, wanting to be able to ex experience activities that then they can talk about online with friends as kind of badge of honour that they've done something, those kind of insider activities that are possibly a bit unusual. And then we have a, a family market. Now these are not, um, these are families who probably their parents engaged with culture before they had kids and they had a bit of a gap. <laughs> now the kids are getting a bit older, they want to bring them into, into culture. And city centres in the UK are often not very family friendly places. But museums and galleries in particular often have a really strong family friendly offer. So it's how we can develop that with tourism providers to think about engaging with those families that actually an urban city break is something that might appeal to a family market. But you have to choose what's right for you. Um, and you have to be realistic about what you can achieve with the resources that you have. And, I, and I'll say again, you need to prioritise. And it's fine if you have a small number, as long as you address that well. If you've got, I don't know, six, eight different segments that you're trying to target, chances are you'll fail, because you're spreading yourself too thinly. It's better to go smaller and focus. But also, you need to understand the seasonal differences in your location. Um, because that will have an impact on who you might um, be looking to target. So what do we do in Manchester? Well, in 2007, um, we had the inaugural Manchester International Festival, which I was lucky to be involved in setting up and was the marketing director for the first one. And after that first festival, 
the museums and galleries in Manchester, um, the core museums, and major museums and galleries, uh, which there are nine, there are, there are others as well, um, said to the um, public sector agencies, hang on a minute, we're here 24 seven, and we're not getting very much profile. And the response back was, well, actually, you're not as good as you think you are. And that was, that was quite a hard thing for them to take on, on board. But they did, and they went back to those agencies. Now, these are in the days before the cuts that we've faced in the UK, um, when there was money around, um, and said, right, OK, if we come up with a vision, will you support us? And they did. But built into that vision was, was product development, was thinking about visitor welcome, merchandising, but also marketing. And the marketing supported all of those venues. And there was this general idea of, well, let's work together around cultural tourism, but that's probably about as far as it went. And at the time, I was working at Marketing Manchester <coughs> as a consultant, um, running their marketing coordination unit, and looking at how to engage tourism with the cultural sector from the tourism side. Um, and we worked very closely together, and it was a baptism of fire for both sectors. You've got two sectors who talk different languages, who work with different timescales. So the tourism sector is often working much further in advance than the cultural sector. So it might be two, three years um, ahead. You've got a cultural sector that's not very good at sharing information with itself, never mind outside that. That kind of confidentiality, can't announce it this till the, se till the season announcement. Um, you've also got um, a broad mix of cultural organisations. So they tend to work in silos, so the museums and galleries will talk to each other and the theatres will talk to each other and the festivals will talk to each other and the orchestras will talk to each other, but they don't necessarily talk across those art forms, let alone with the tourism sector. And I was in the middle of this and it was really interesting. I had the cultural sector whinging in one ear and the tourism um, partners whinging in, another ear, in the other ear because they didn't really understand each other. It was like being a, a, a diplomat and translator all in one. Um, and getting them to think about what is it we're trying to achieve. And, and originally they were probably a little bit over ambitious, thinking they could change everything in the city, and you can't. So it's, it was focused down and focused down. Um, and one of the things that was developed was, um, has now become createdtourist.com, which is really an online um, cultural tourism magazine. Started out from Manchester and now is more broadly across the north. Um, started out supporting the museums and galleries, but very quickly we realised that actually if you're going to talk about a destination, you have to talk more broadly about what there is on offer. But it was very much about content. And the reason we set it up was we felt that the official Marketing Manchester, or the Visit Manchester web uh, site, didn't really address the needs of the cultural sector. It was much more traditional and quite um, bland in the way that it talks about the cultural sector. Very much focused on buildings. We've got this theatre, we've got this museum, we've got this gallery. Not really an understanding of, of what the cultural offer was. And so we very much focused on a content-led approach, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about content marketing, and creating and commissioning good quality content to talk about the cultural offer in a very different way. So we weren't led by the technology, but we harnessed the digital opportunities, and particularly spotted a gap in the market. And it meant that we could be more independent, we could have an editorial approach. So when I talked about not being diplomatic and democratic, so we'd get partners coming and saying, can you include this exhibition uh, on creativetourist.com? And we said, sorry, no, it doesn't fit. We're not saying it's not a good exhibition, but it's not appropriate for this market. And again, that's really hard to justify back at base, saying, well, no, they won't put it on. It's like, well, it's just not right for this market. You have to find another, another route for that. Um, so we created itineraries, and we do create I itineraries, suggested itineraries, things to do. So if you're coming for a weekend, it's that insider's guide, places to go. And that's not just the cultural sector, that's food and drink, that's where to stay, that's other tourism activities to do whilst you're there. 
um, and creating, trying to make it easy for the visitor and easy to make the decision to choose you above somewhere else. But it, we've taken risks along the way, it's a learning journey, we've made mistakes along the way, um, but we've learned from those mistakes. We've had the opportunity to take risks, which is really important. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we've been going for about five years. Um, we've, we've completely redone the website to be more trackable, um, to be more focused on the visitor. Um, we've created a, a recognisable tone of voice for, for creative tourists um, and a trusted voice, which is really important. So if we make a recommendation, People really do listen to that and take that on board and share that with friends and family. Um, we work right across the board um, with different platforms. We still have a, an ongoing relationship with Marketing Manchester and still after five years, I wouldn't say we're completely embedded yet, but we're still working at it. Um, because obviously they have lots of other things that they have to do as well. Um, you know, they, the accommodation providers are often the noisiest people in the room. Um, the um, attention to bed nights can become so dominant and then you have big players who also want the profile um, and can often drown out some of the smaller players. We found it's actually easier to work directly with individual hotels and try to get them in a room together unless you feel like you want to be in front of a firing squad, I wouldn't necessarily advise it. Um, it's easier to develop relationships directly with hotel managers um, and see what can be done, and it, and it takes a lot of time um, to do that. We've built a relationship with a, a ticketing affiliate that's cost us absolutely nothing. They've done all the work, they've created the, the back-end um, facility, so it means that people can book, direct, book tickets with us directly. We've set up a cultural concierge um, program, working with visitor services staff and front of house staff in, in venues, so that they feel confident to talk about what the rest of the city has to offer, not just themselves. And that's quite a step forward. As I was, I was talking to somebody yesterday, we've not cracked the hotel concierge system. It's a dark art. Uh, and we're not prepared to give backhanders to, to do that. So, um, so we're still plugging away on that one. And we look at um, developing seasonal campaigns as well, and focused around certain big activities. So this summer we just had uh, Manchester International Festival again, so we've built activity um, around that. So, the other thing that we, we do is um, we create kind of boutique events, and in the autumn, in the September, October, November period, we have, a, we have a, an explosion of cultural activity that, that happens, and um, it's the same uh, across the UK. So, you get all the new theatre seasons and orchestra seasons and lots of festivals. Uh, big um, museum and gallery shows opening, but there was nothing that was knitting it together. There was nothing to say, right, come to Manchester because we've got so much happening. So we created something called the Manchester Weekender and we work with local artists and local promoters to create um, unusual um, events in non-traditional spaces or cultural events happening in different cultural venues, things happening indoors, things happening outdoors, even if the weather's not good, that was a particularly good day. Um, and it's about creating those intimate experiences. And it's the difference between cultural tourism and creative tourism, in that this example here was a, a flash mob um, exhibition. So a professional photographer working with a group of amateur photographers who went round the city taking photographs, working with um, a printer to produce large-scale photos and then just appearing in different points in the city and creating a, a pop-up exhibition. Um, lots of activities that are hands-on, that um, families could get involved in, um, that visitors could get involved in um, as well, so that there was a, an element of producing something over the course um, uh, of the weekend. But the great thing is with cultural tourism is that whatever you do that's focused on visitors has benefits to locals. And we find that locals are often our best ambassadors. They're the ones on Twitter saying, you've got to come up to Manchester this weekend, there's masses happening. Um, and without the local support, it just doesn't work anyway. 
It's not something that you can just do. So we, we set up a, a walkies tour for people to bring their dogs uh, and take them around um, different cultural sites within the, the uh, city centre. But we also are very active on social media ourselves and we, we engage with our social media um, audiences uh, and, and keep that conversation going. doesn't matter what, what's happening, not just around things like Manchester Weekend. So that's our, our new website, uh, Screen Grab From. Just a very quick one. We did produce an app. This is one of our learning experiences. Uh, in the early days of Creative Tourists, I think some of our colleagues were quite excited about, about trying new things and possibly rushed it. And the worst thing you can do with an app is produce one and then not have any money to promote it. Um, and we rushed to do it and it's not brilliant and we haven't had the money to, to continue really promoting it. And so that's on our list of things to do. So I think people get too carried away when new opportunities, new technical opportunities come up. And if you forget why you're doing it and what it's for and who it's for and invest the resources, then things don't work. Um, that's just a, an example of our, um, our Twitter site. But you can see, if you, if you can read any of the text there, that the style of how we talk through Creative Tourist, which is quite chatty and informal, but knowledgeable about um, the sector, and how we constantly are engaging with our followers. And similarly on uh, Facebook as well. And the consistency around the brand identity and how we carry that through um, everything else. So I just want to give you some other examples um, of other places in the UK and what they've done around cultural tourism. Uh, as I'm sure um, quite a number of you are aware that Liverpool uh, was the European capital of culture in 2008. Um, two, two major things that I wanted to flag up here. One is when they were awarded capital of culture, they had a four year program of activity building up to 2008 with themed years of activity. But the really clever thing that they did was they set up a longitudinal research program that started four years out and went through to 2012. So they had this really long period of time where they could do some really detailed research. Um, and it wasn't just about visitor numbers and visitor spend and economic impact, which of course is really important, but it was about perception. And I, talked to, I wasn't joking when I was saying about the perception of up north by the, by the southern um, London-centric media. Um, Liverpool, when they were awarded capital culture, did the first perception study, and it was really bad. And people's perception of Liverpool was, um, it's not safe. I don't understand why it's been awarded capital culture. What is there apart from the Beatles and Liverpool Football Club? Um, and it gave them the opportunity to think about what they needed to work on. Um, now, having gone all the way through to 2012, it's a completely different story. It's now moved right up the list of places that people want to visit as, as cultural tourists. Um, there's been massive investment in infrastructure, as always happens with these major programmes. Um, but also, it's focused on a, on a major event strategy. So this event, which was one of the, the highlights of the, the year uh, in 2008, which is La Machine, and it produced this huge spider that crawled through the, the city, which was a free event. Um, they did another one with that company last year. Um, now that, that does take a lot of money, there's no doubt about it. But they have focused on events, and not just cultural events, but sporting events, and they've got international festival business. And they've realized that having a strong events program helps to punctuate opportunities through the year to encourage visitors to come and come back. So, Manchester International Festival I mentioned earlier. Um, we had funding uh, before the festival started to do a series of pre-festival commissions. The festival is all about new work, it's all about new commissions on a large scale. Um, and so we worked with um, the animated band, Gorillas, which is Damon Alban from Blur and Jamie Hewlett, um, to put on a series of concerts 
in this beautiful Victorian theatre, the Opera House, uh, in the centre of Manchester, where they played their first album all the way through. Um, funnily enough, that hadn't been done before like that. Now everybody's doing it. They're plucking out their favourite album and doing it all the way through in an unusual venue. But this was in 2005. And this was a marker. This was saying, this is our intention. This is what we're planning to do. We're planning to do something on a large scale that's innovative, that's new. And we had people travelling from as far as Australia and Japan and America to come and see the, these events. And then when it came to Manchester International Festival itself, this is actually an image from 2009, um, we worked very closely with um, the tourism agency. We, part of the reason for doing those pre-festival commissions was to be able to have something to talk about when we actually couldn't announce the programme that far in advance. And then we did announce three shows, one of which was Monkey Journey to the West with, with um, Damon Elvin and Jada Hewlett, so that we could talk in general about this new event, because it's very difficult for the tourism industry to get their head around something that's new that they haven't seen. They don't know how to talk about it. And you have to provide the content for them to be able to do that. And we worked with um, a, a hotel as one of the main sponsors. We worked with travel operators, they were sponsors as well. We worked with the tourism agencies to bring journalists from all over the world to do familiarisation visits. We worked with the tourism agency to go and do a launch in New York, um, America being a key market for um, the UK. Um, and we prioritised where we knew that there were important markets for the city. We worked very closely with the city council who understood that the business messages needed the cultural messages. So if you want to try and target businesses to come and relocate to a destination, those businesses need to understand that there is a strong cultural offer as well. Whether they engage in it or not, their perception is they want things to be able to do whilst they're there. They want things their family can do whilst they're there. So the council worked very closely with us on that and it's gone from um, strength to strength. It still gets a lot of local visitors, it still gets a lot of domestic visitors from around the UK, but it also gets a growing number of international visitors as well. So very, very quickly, as I'm conscious of the time, um, Newcastle Gateshead. Now, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had those two names of, of cities next to each other. Everybody just says Newcastle Gateshead now. They are two adjoining cities, well, the River Tyne in the middle, um, and Gateshead was the city that, that took some risks that thought, we're going to invest in cultural infrastructure. They commissioned Nancy Gormley to create the Angel of the North. They, they created the Baltic Contemporary Arts venue in an old flour mill. They created the Sage, a contemporary music and classical music venue, because they were seen as the poor relation in, in comparison to Newcastle. And the best thing that probably happened to Newcastle Gateshead was not winning European Capital of Culture in 2008. And they decided that even though they hadn't won, they would invest in a 10-year programme of cultural activity and focus very much on cultural tourism. And they had a very strong programme, particularly event-led programme, where they would focus activity around weekends and do a lot of promotion to the domestic market to encourage people to come um, to the area. Sadly, we've gone past the 10 years. Newcastle, this year, with all the cuts that are happening, the council threatened to cut 100% of its arts funding. A terrible legacy of its 10-year cultural programme. And the Arts Council England had to step in, and I think it's probably only about 50% now. But terrible PR, and they probably wouldn't be very happy I'm talking about it in the sad world either. Um, but uh, it's online. Um, but, uh, but Gateshead said, no, we're not. Culture is really important and we're not cutting it at all. So really interesting that Newcastle was the dominant city and actually Gateshead had come out as the stronger cultural supporter.
Um, Yorkshire, or God's own county as they like to call themselves, uh, the biggest county in, in England. Um, they have a number of, of sculpture-based attractions. This, this is Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It's a wonderful piece by Homie Plenzer. Um, and it's set in acres of beautiful countryside. They have uh, two indoor venues, but also they have permanent sculptures all over the park and temporary exhibitions as well. But what they've done is they've linked up with the, the relatively new Hepworth uh, in Wakefield, celebrating Barbara Hepworth, the sculptor, and they have new exhibitions there as well. Wakefield's not really known as a destination. It doesn't really have a great deal else apart from um, the Hepworth. It does have a cultural infrastructure, but not particularly geared to um, visitors. And they've also linked to um, the Henry Moore Institute and Leeds Art Gallery to create a Yorkshire Sculpture Triangle um, and to do some joint marketing activity around that Sculpture Triangle. So if somebody's going to Yorkshire Sculpture Park, you've got to drive there. Um, the idea is get, get back in your car and go to the Hepburn or go into Leeds. And it's actually starting to take hold now. People are starting to understand um, the importance of that Sculpture Triangle. One interesting point, they're very clear about their, their position uh, nationally and internationally around sculpture, and they don't overclaim. So they're providing information to Welcome to Yorkshire, which is the tourism marketing agency, and they, they changed it. And they um, said something about it being the home of sculpt sculpture and the most important place, and that classic marketing hyperbole. And they got lambasted in The Guardian by the architecture um, writer Jonathan Jones saying, um, what about Rome? What about the Middle East? What about, you know, Greece? Uh, and it just made them look stupid. And the, the unfortunate thing was that it wasn't the Yorkshire Sculpture Triangle who'd said that, but it was their partner. So you, you have to manage these, these relationships. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so it's quite opportune talking about um, Cockermouth here. Cockermouth is in Cumbria. Cumbria is mainly known for the Lake District, but Cockermouth is not in the Lake District. Um, and it suffered terrible floods a few years ago. Um, but it has a strong cultural identity that's quite separate from the Lake District. And we worked with the Tourist Board to create an event with um, called the Cockermouth Weekend, you can see a theme there. Um, and it was focused on a small number of visitors who were paying for this experience. Um, and we brought Stuart McConey in, who is a writer and broadcaster um, from the north, who loves Cumbria. Um, and we put on a series of activities so people could do the whole weekend or they could dip in and out. Um, and one of our learnings was we could have charged more. Because the visitors came and said, it's been fantastic, you could have charged more. So for the next time they certainly will. Um, but it was the insiders' experience. So they got to meet local brewers, they, they ate local produce, they went on walks with guides, Stuart McConey took them round on a guide. Um, they experienced a sound installation that had been produced by a local artist that had been originally produced for a festival. It was an opportunity to, to bring that back to life again. Because often what happens, as you know, with things that are commissioned for festivals, is sometimes they don't get another life. Um, and we gave them access to things that ordinary members of the public wouldn't get access to. And whilst it was, it was a small event to test the market and to see the kinds of people who came, and we had about a third were local, a third were um, people who regularly go to the Lake District, and a third were from much further afield. But the, those that had not only come to the Lake District had never been to Cockermouth before, and were, were saying that they would go back. Can I have a next Okay, so this one is, is quite close to my heart as a, as a project I work on, and if you look at the dates, it's starting next month. Um, so I've left my brother uh, dealing with this one. Um, this is uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, which is about an hour south of Manchester. It's a post-industrial city. It's the, the Potteries, a major
major ceramic capital, um, suffered a lot of decline, but there are still thousands and thousands of people working in the ceramics industry in Stoke-on-Trent, but the media like to depict it as, as, a, as a town that's, that's on its knees, uh, and that's not true. Um, we created this Contemporary Ceramics Festival. This, um, our hub, uh, is actually in the former ceramics factory, but we also work with um, the main museum that has a fantastic ceramic collection as well. Um, and it's edgy stuff, and it's risky, and we, we place artists with indus local industries. We don't know what's going to come out of that process. Um, and it's, we also understand that the food and drink offer locally is poor. So we work with a, a catering provider and, pro and provide a cafe on site. We know the accommodation offer is not great, so we handpick um, accommodation providers and, and work um, with them on developing special offers, and we promote those. Um, we work with um, the transport operator, and you might have seen in an earlier slide there were some little clay men on a, on a platform. Um, we work with an artist who wanted to um, use some of his work as installations throughout the city. So we talked to the train station manager who we had a relationship with and the night before the festival we were placing these thousands of these little men all over this train station and the route to the, um, uh, the factory where the exhibition is taking place. And the idea being that people could just pick them up and take them. And brilliant on social media because at the same time the artist did it in London on London Bridge and there was so much chatter about it um, and he's since gone on to do it in other, other places and people still now, there's pictures posted of the little clay men, it's like people take pictures of gnomes around the world, it's like these little clay men um, and we're working again with that artist uh, this year. Thank you. He's anticipating me now, it's very good. Um, but very quickly, research evaluation is really, really difficult. Um, the cultural sector collects data and the tourism sector collects data and they're different data sets and you can't just put them together and suddenly you've got cultural tourism data. Um, you end up with double and sometimes triple counting because everybody wants to claim that what, what uh, if there's been increase in visitors that is what they've done. Um, so you need to understand what are your benchmarks, which data sets are you going to be using, um, how do you avoid that double counting. Um, but the quantitative data, in other words, the numbers of visitors and the spend and the economic impact is really important and there's no doubt that policy makers are really interested in that. Um, but the qualitative feedback is equally important and we track um, uh, what people are saying online, um, so we feed that into our evaluation, um, you know, we talk to visitors, we get their feedback. Um, you know, we've done familiarisation visits with um, bloggers, we do a lot of work with, with bloggers, we've set up a Blog North network um, and we've brought um, mummy bloggers, I hate that term, uh, but mummy bloggers with their kids um, and, you know, it, it's priceless when they say on a blog that they get masses of followers, I would never have thought of taking my family to Manchester but I'll be going back now at a fantastic time. Um, and don't underestimate the importance of bloggers as well as more traditional journalists. But because of this conundrum, we're creating our own cultural tourism research framework, working with an associate researcher to try and look at appropriating the impacts that we um, can make and have made. We know when we do something like Manchester Weekender, you can put an evaluation program in place for that and you also know with ticket sales and things like that. But on a general day-to-day -day basis it's quite difficult to be able to allocate directly the impact that you're having. Nearly there now. So, <clears throat> you're probably sitting there thinking, oh God, what do I do now? I don't want to bother with it, or I want to pass it on to somebody else. Um, one of the key things is about being open and honest and that's that's within your organisation, that's with partners. Um, because there's no doubt visitors will see where the weaknesses are. Um, and you need to be up front. We're doing some work at the moment with Blackpool, uh, which I'm sure a number of you will, will have heard of, uh, which is a traditional seaside resort in the northwest, built on uh, a 
heritage of entertainment, commercial entertainment. Um, and it's now trying to look at cultural tourism. <clears throat> and you, you do get some people saying, well, we, we just want volume. I don't really bother who it is, we just want volume. Because they're used to massive numbers of visitors. But their visitor patterns are changing. And they need to change to attract new types of visitors. And they're going to have to go on quite a challenging journey. They have a strong heritage, buried. Um, they have a very transient population. Um, and a lot of the commercial entertainment you can actually experience in different parts of the country. So there's a sense of, well, why would I go there to see that show that I've just had in my own city or I've just seen in London or whatever. So it's quite a challenging environment for them and they have some really big, noisy players there as well, whether it's the Tower or the Pleasure Beach, um, who are always at the table. So you can't do this without those people. And they want to be at the table, but they're also looking for, can I get some more investment to develop something that I want to do as well? So there's a, you know, they're in the early stages of their journey. But they have some partnerships already in place, and sometimes a smaller place can work more effectively because you can get those partnerships in, in place. Um, sometimes the, the bigger the destination, the more difficult it, it is. But there will be partnerships you can already build on and build up. But you have to be prepared to share information. We work with cultural organisations and they share program ideas two to three years in advance and sometimes further. And they trust us that we're not going to blurt that out to media. But we can't plan ahead unless we know that. We can't plan with our tourism partners unless we know what's being planned. We also need to have that overview of where the peaks are in the destination over a period of time so that we know where to focus additional activity around. So that's really important. And that does take time um, to build that trust. What, what other tourism friendly brands do you already have? Maybe you've got a strong heritage offer. Norwich uh, in East Anglia, where we've done um, some work, has a partnership in place, uh, the Norwich 12, which focuses on heritage specifically. Where it's, it's, if anybody knows Norwich, um, you'll, you'll understand this, but it's a beautiful medieval city it's bypassed by the Industrial Revolution, so it has the most medieval architecture, I think, in, in Britain, and it really is a beautiful place. But it has negative <coughs> perception associated with it, largely thanks to Steve Coogan and his Alan Partridge character, if anybody know that, um, which is simply not true. Um, but the, the Heritage 12 group worked internationally with Ghent in Europe to do some really interesting work and develop ambassador schemes, working with taxi operators and they're extending that. What they haven't done yet is broaden that out and work more with the cultural sector. But there is a partnership there already in place that the cultural sector can tap into. Um, I, oh no, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, it's about understanding what your daytime offer is, but also what your nighttime offer is and what your weekend offer is. We have a problem at home with the 5 to 7 p.m. So people finishing work and, and going home and the kind of evening kicking in. Well, if you're a visitor, that's a really important time for you. You don't be wandering around somewhere that's closed. So you have to understand what, what your round-the-clock offer is. Who are the independents? And quite often you get some really interesting people running independent retail or food and drink or accommodation um, that would be interested to partner up with you. Um, but don't be generic in the way that you do it. You have to be focused and you have to think this is not McDonald's style marketing and even they segment um, their marketing. This is about very focused visitor oriented um, marketing and product development and everything else. You have a great opportunity to talk directly with visitors we didn't have 20 years ago to find out the kinds of things that they're interested in and to develop that relationship with visitors before they come, whilst they're here, and crucially, after they've gone home as well. But you do need to commit in the long term to this. And finally, my top 10 tips. So if you're going to go down this road or if you're partway down this, this journey, you need to do your homework. 
what are other places doing that, that might be of interest? Or that you think, well, that's interesting. Go and talk to them or pick up the phone and have a chat to them. Quite often people are willing to discuss um, things that are uh, seen to be successful. Um, but also you can do an awful lot online. There'll be places you visited yourself and you thought, well, that was really interesting, or that was not good. Um, so the understanding what isn't good is actually sometimes more important than understanding what is good. Um, but someone needs to take the lead, whether that's you, whether that's somebody in your organisation. You cannot also sit back, and I've had this experience with clients where I've sat in a room and they've all gone, it's not my responsibility, it should be the X agency. And it's like, that's too easy to say that. So if you're all sat there thinking, well, it's, it's up to us, Queensland. Yes, they need to be at the table and they may take the lead, but you all have to take a responsibility in this as well. And this isn't just about thinking about the whole region. You need to look at where your hotspots are, where the critical mass of activity is and how you can build on that. Constantly have to be thinking about the visitor, what their needs and what their experiences, what they're looking for, not what you think they're looking for. You need to review your own marketing communications activity. Is it right for the market? Are you talking about your destination and your cultural marketing? Are your tourism partners talking in the right way about the cultural offer? You need to look at what your baseline is for evaluation, because I'm sure it's the same here in those, the public um, policy and public agencies needing to have that information. And actually, you don't know what's working if you don't evaluate what you're doing. What's your events timeline? Are there things that you can build around? Are there particular hooks? Who are the partners that need to be at the table? What resources can you access that are already there or potential new resources? As I talked about the Cockermouth Weekender, um, test stuff, pilot stuff, and see what works and what doesn't. If you try and start really big and that fails, then everybody loses interest and they'll want to move on to the next big thing. And my final plea, um, you don't need to come up with a logo or a strap line or a slogan. Visitors see straight through those and they are meaningless. It's a waste of time and money. Your destination is your brand. Okay, thank you very much.